Hello, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to The Outcast. I am your host, once again, Wolf, and I am joined by... HC. And Rush. And if you haven't noticed from the title card, once again, we are covering Ruby, this time of Volume 2. And as always, for when we do our show stuff, how about we start off with a bit of general thoughts and opinions on the overall season, or volume. <clears throat> Season volume at the end of the day, it's a bunch of episodes that tell a story. So, same thing. Mm -hmm. Um, okay, I'll just say that I enjoyed season two, volume two, season two, whatever. I'll, I'll go by season, it's easier. So, I okay. enjoyed season two a, a lot more than season one. Not that season one was bad, you can go back and listen to how much I liked season one, but season two just felt Okay, we got it. We got the basics down. You know what you need to know. Let Let's move on. Let's Let's move on and start um, introducing new elements and new stuff and everything. I just enjoyed it a lot more. And yeah, the I think the second season opening grabbed me. Like when I first saw it, I said, um, I think I like season one's opening better. And then like, no, I like season two's opening better. So that's my quick oh, non-spoiler. You mean the first episode? You mean the actual like intro to the show, like the intro no, song? I, I mean, yeah, the, the intro song, the opening sequence. Okay. So, you, what did you really like about it? The just the song or everything? Yeah, the song. The song is more, I guess you could say, my thing. Like oh, it's okay. it leans more to it leans more towards a rock, <clears throat> towards a rock song than J-pop. Which I love J-pop, don't get me wrong, but yeah, <laughs> the, but you know, you get some electric guitar in there. I'm sold. Mm -hmm. Fair. Rush thoughts. <clears throat> I um, I enjoyed this chapter. Nope, volume. There we go. <laughs> <laughs> not not as is yeah. not a volume chapter this is not as that's not, unfortunately not as exchangeable as season and volume um <clears throat> i do like hc said it's finally kicking up um you know it mm -hmm. we said this about kind of race to the edge where the first season was an introduction and then the next season they that's when they actually introduce, you know, more elements of the plot and you kind of get to see where the story is going. Like, sure, in volume one, we had who we now know as Cinder um, in this volume, but like we see her and so it was like, oh, she'll be a plot element, but then she wasn't even at, she wasn't towards the end of volume one, if I remember correctly yeah she I was guess like the post credit she, scene technically yeah. she was post credit scene and technically she was at the very beginning of volume one too well yeah so she was in volume one <laughs> but you're like she was at the beginning of volume one and you're thinking well what does she have to do with it when you barely see her when you don't see her until a post credit scene like you, you go the whole season thinking well what was that all about and then you get to this season and then you figure out what's going on and oh, so nice this like i said it's just this now they're actually moving on with a story volume one was granted it was fun it was still set up and so this is where you get a lot of story elements um i'm not gonna say that they didn't have this plan uh so it unlike racy had season five and six where they got renewed and they're like oh crap what do we do now this one like they had they at least had a plan for the um mm -hmm the new seasons as they came and such like that so there's there's cohesion is basically what i'm saying it's not like what why is you know story? um uh talking about that uh wolf actually we we pretty much uh, established last time that this is uh, this is an indie show right pretty much yeah i would say so mm -hmm. i don't know if i so call it that, but i would definitely call it that mm -hmm. uh, what i'm what i'm the reason i'm asking this is because it, does the makers of the show have any higher ups that they need to answer to in terms of season number or episode number per season, or they, they can just let it go on as much as they want? I think, um, personally, I don't really know exactly the company structure of Rooster Teeth, but like I know they have 
people who they do kind of who they are higher have, up than them. Yeah, they do have a management but, stru management structure. And sorry to cut you off, Wolf, but oh, you're sure. I, I you might know more about it than I do. Well, this doesn't have to do anything with about. <laughs> I mean, yes, it does have a management management structure, um, but <clears throat> the fact that these episodes are eventually released as free, hence why we're able to watch them, gives me the idea that it's not. It's not a matter of, is it, you know, like, let's say, uh, let's go to some different shows like Young Justice or Teen Titans. It's not a matter of, are we getting views for money off of this? Uh, although Young Justice was merchandising issue, but it's for Ruby, it's more of, you know, since they're releasing it for free, well, um, it's not like it's a money issue of them producing it. It's, I'm guessing, more of a are people watching it issue um, yeah it's very much like i think for to give you an example right i don't think they're releasing volume six to youtube and i don't think they're going to re release future volumes of ruby to youtube so i think right like their goal is to generate <clears throat> traffic for their own site mm -hmm. you know, for the roosterteeth.com site and to get people to pay up for what they call rooster teeth first yes. which basically means you get to watch their episodes before other people like the way they do their release schedule is one episode a week and like a few days earlier in the week anyone who pays for rooster teeth first which is like i think five bucks a month i don't know don't quote me just so, give it an idea of so the it's kind of like so the episode first so, but yeah so it's kind of like a patreon yeah yeah we're just a a premium membership yeah. but you would pay for like yeah. youtube red TV too, that too. Yeah. um one thing that you you that actually you brought that up since they're not putting on youtube anymore is that they're now deciding to at least in a more focused sense i'd say monetize ruby because it's that that makes me think that it is more popular if they want to take it off youtube and bring it to their own site they saw how popular it was getting sort of like well now we need to get our own cut of this or you could also argue yeah. that YouTube just wasn't, it wasn't bringing enough money, whereas they could get more money through even their own ads on their website, et cetera, et cetera. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so. pretty yeah. much stuff like that. But, um, yeah, my general thoughts on Ruby, I guess I should say. Moving on, off topic. <laughs> but uh, yeah, the, I think... That was the outcast to an outcast, the, <clears throat> the management of Ruby. Now yeah. we're back to the main thing. But yeah, um, Ruby is definitely not a show that I think they have to answer to a lot. I think there's just, I think there's a set idea of what they want to do. And they're pretty much kind of given the go ahead to, yeah, you can do what you need to. Everything you've done so far is working out fairly well. I'm sure if Ruby hit a really rough patch where just nobody watched it, you'd probably see some changes at that point. <laughs> as you would with any show i'm sure mm -hmm. yeah. but um my thoughts on ruby i don't know if i said this in uh, overall in general in volume two is that i don't know if i said this in our first episode but i do think i said this offhandedly to hc before recording and that is that i think watching ruby for like all of all five volumes so far i really do believe that ruby has been a learning experience not just for fans but also for the people behind the show especially for the people behind the show it's been a learning experience for them as creators in creating the show and i think every single volume of ruby every single season you can see an improvement in some way shape or form from volume to volume and i think that's definitely apparent in volume one to volume two. And for me personally, I think that volume one, while it was good, while it was enjoyable, there was nothing there that really caught me, that really made me say, okay, I'm in. There was enough there that made me say, all right, I want to see where this goes. I want to watch more of this because I'm interested in it. But volume two, I think there was a lot more episodes in volume two that said, okay, I'm into this. I'm down for this. I want to see more for this. This has caught me. And I don't think that's any more apparent than the first episode of volume two. And going to roll that right into that and say, this is our spoilers. This is our thoughts on episode one, on volume two, episode one, the best day ever. 
Um, Holy, Holy, the probably the best food fight episode I've ever seen of any <laughs> show. Mm. Absolutely. That was so. This was the episode that Ruby was sold to me on. This was I didn't hear anything about Volume One. I heard two people talking about Volume Two in this particular episode, and with zero context. Imagine hearing this show, this episode in particular, described to you with zero context. It sounds <laughs> it sounds insane, and my immediate thought was, okay, I need to watch this because it sounds like it would be right up my alley. And it most assuredly was. <laughs> Mark, I think my favorite part about the whole thing was um, uh, I'm still trying to figure the to figure the name is out. So if I mispronounce or miss or uh, just say you know, color, you probably might get. <laughs> the, okay, Ruby's sister. Uh, Yang. Yang, just call her by the Yang. end of her name, Yang. The blonde girl. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I'm sure so well. I, I, I like how you know her weapon is essentially like uh, the quote unquote boxing gloves. I so... call them shotgun mm -hmm. gauntlets. But he's talking about the chickens, though, in this case. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So here, them. so here, like she uses the chickens, and I'm like, that's that's clever in all the right ways. Like you mm -hmm. know. I think it was it was in one I don't remember I think it was the 2012 version of the Ninja Turtles where Splinter like tells the turtles try and switch up the your weapons so that you won't get used to one specific to a specific weapon and you know they just as they start using like you know Donald Trump instead of a stick uses a broom and something so it seems like a very Interesting, funny, and unique take on an on an idea like this. That she just take two chickens and fights with it. That's amazing. It's also, you know, really clever. Like again, like everything about the food fight is done really clever. You see Weiss holding a swordfish and using it like you would a rapier. You see Blake using, you know, a roll of sausages like she would her regular mm -hmm. weapon. Like yeah. there's a ton of clever stuff mm -hmm. going on here. Uh, one thing I do want to point out uh, to those who listen to our season one uh, podcast about Ruby, uh, you might remember I compared the art style to Gravity Rush. It's a PlayStation Vita or PlayStation 4 game. Yeah. Um... So, so there, there's something Ruby does in this episode that you know she zooms forward and then like she starts spinning, uh, and uh, you know mm -hmm. she she. She cuts for something. That's like like that. That is gravity rush to a point. Like that. That's something the cat, the protagonist, does all the time. So, um, just uh, something fun I want to point out. And not calling, uh, not calling rip off or something. Uh, on the contrary, it was great to be reminded of that. Oh but... no, I mean, like Ruby, remember Ruby, Like that was them showing off Ruby Simlitz, and that's something you know that, that should point out. The show does, I think, a lot better job of showing off semblances in this volume, too. Yes. Right? Like, you see mm -hmm. way more people using their semblance, and you get a better understanding of what people's semblances are. Like, I think they do way better at showing you, okay, so that's Ruby using her speed semblance, or that's Pyrrha using her polarity semblance. Like, you get a way better view of that this time around. And mm -hmm. to ask you a question... There actually is a bit of a, you know, I guess you'd say a graphical upgrade. Number one, no more shadow people. Yeah. What did you think yeah. about that? <laughs> <laughs> well, it's obviously an improvement, but at the same time, mm -hmm. it's kind of an artistic choice I like. Mm -hmm. I don't know. I, but, you know, I thought what, it, it's... the having <clears throat> shadow people or not having shadow people? HC. Like, um, you know, having the shadow people, you know, the people that don't have uh, much of I thought it was an, in, you know, if we don't have the budget, then it was a nice compromise to, and to the point you could say it's an artistic choice. Yeah. So I, I like that in that regard, but, you know, I won't lose sleep over the fact that now we have an actual, an actual crowd. Yeah, <clears throat> background crowd. Yeah, for me, like, it's I, I it's charming in the first season when you don't have much going on but if you're gonna have mm -hmm. like a super serious plot line going on like this it, it i think it detracts from it it seems a little too i don't want to say childish it just seems a little too 
low cut. It stands out too yeah. much. Yeah, and when you want to focus on the story, so it's a little distracting if they were mm-hmm. to keep it. Because honestly, a black silhouette is more distracting when you have a very few bunch of characters that are designed as opposed to your generic character <clears throat> A through triple as C. As opposed to your entire tribe that's made out of Hiccup and Heather that is basically wearing masks. <laughs> <laughs> when you said entire tribe, I thought you were going to spoil a certain part in, se- in a later season. But... No. <laughs> but you know no what i <laughs> <laughs> HC hasn't seen any of it and I want him to go into it spoil free because it's going to be fun to oh. hear what he has to say it well, doesn't matter. I don't care about that well, but I, I don't want to say anything about volume uh, three because that is mm-hmm. HC you're going to have to leave mm-hmm. early because I want to talk to Wolf about some stuff <laughs> mm-hmm. okay so you know what you know me after the show we always do after we finish this so this time you two go ahead and have fun I'll go do something else once we once we're done <laughs> so uh it should mention like our first entrance to Mercury and Emerald. What did you think about them? Um, I, um, who who's the girl from the two? Uh, Emerald is the girl, and she's the green-haired girl with the red eyes. Yeah, and you have Mercury so... with the silver hair. Yeah, so I I want to say I like her design. I don't, it's not often you see character design with the green hair. So mm. I don't know. It it was unique to me. I like that. And we see our first and last intro to poor Tux and the bookstore owner. <laughs> yeah, he will be missed. He will be missed. Not really. <laughs> All because he didn't um, have one book. Should point out, you know, we get to finally... What did you think of uh, Cinder's voice actress as well? We finally get to hear her voice in full. I think mm. the voice fits. Um, mm-hmm. Definitely the... Uh, what do you call it? Like the the temptress style voice, where mm-hmm. it's like an underlying. Um, God, I haven't had my. Well, I'm still somewhat awake. I haven't had my coffee because I ran out of coffee filters. So it's like I can't remember any of the words of I want to say. Yeah, <laughs> I'm awake, but I just can't remember the words. So, oh well. We'll um, get you there. An underlying tone mm-hmm. of evil, because words. <laughs> I get what you mean, though. Yeah, she's very. Ha- she has a very. Uh, you can tell. You know, she's like the voice is very much underlying temptation. Like, follow me because you want to follow me because I'm. I look like I'm worth following, but you really shouldn't follow me. Like you can tell. Like she's the person who she's really going to stab you in the back if you follow her. Very much. I get. Like I think temptress is a very good word for her. Mm-hmm. Personally. And a small intro to Sun's partner, Neptune. A fun character, I think. Mm -hmm. Who many people, I think, also dislike. I don't know. I find him fun. For the most part. (laughs) (laughs) Any other thoughts, though, about our intro to Volume 2? Great first episode. And yeah, that's, that's pretty much it. It, like yeah. I sat and I said, I, I'm hooked. Let's uh, keep this going. Absolutely. I said the same thing. I think personally, it's a really, I think it sets the bar extremely well for volume two. And I don't think that bar is really dropped at all either for volume two. Mm-hmm. So with that said, episode two, welcome to Beacon. Yeah. <clears throat> uh, so... No, I like I, I like this episode as well. Um, um, I I also liked how you know Blake. Uh, this was a very I don't know to say Blake centric centric in a sense, but you know it it is interesting to see actually opening up about about her past and how and you know how she does want to start to to stop them uh, white the white fang. fangs right. Yeah. yeah. So, uh, so yeah, I, I like the fact that you, because she's she's the close character, she's the loner, she's <clears> everything. <throat> so it's again, I I, I kind of like those plots. So yeah, and it did as well. So that's that's cool. What did you think about Ironwood? Hmm. The general from Atlas. 
Oh, oh yeah. Hmm. I, okay. First of all, great name. I'll say this much. <laughs> and, and also, uh, you know, in the context of this world, then what uh, what exactly is they're teaching in this school? Because you, the, the school is basically to become a huntress or mm-hmm. hunters or Huntsman. and everything. Hunter, you know, hunters yeah. of them. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so in a school in a school where you you are being taught to hunt and fight and you know basically face danger every day and as we'll see a bit later your your field trips <laughs> are missions for all intents and purposes it it I I like the idea that there's a general or at least that that some sort of an army organization is keeping watch of the school. And um, and actually, he's not keeping watch of Beacon. He's keeping watch of his own academy in Atlas. Atlas is an entirely different kingdom, <laughs> and Beacon is within Vale, which is an entirely different kingdom. It's something that okay. it's not that I think you'll kind of. It's the show is probably not as clear as it could be, but yeah, I think overall I think it kind of gets the the intro across later the, the in mess- this season or the next season. Yeah, a little bit later. But yeah, uh, Ironwood is the general of Atlas, which is its own school and system that they have going on. Very different from you know, Vale but, and Beacon. But still, there's some sort of a communica- communication about um, about what's going on. And you know, Again, we see later in the season when stuff do go wrong. He's kind of the authority that tells, that tells Aspen, you know, Something's not right here, and there there are consequence there are there are consequences for this. So I so I like the fact that it, it just seems to create a bigger world here that mm-hmm. you know either 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 is controlling controlling the school or the other part of another school. There's a sense of unity here, like you can get the urgency that we're in a war and we and we need to take this seriously. So yeah, I like I that. Agree. You, you definitely get the sense of like there's more to this world and there's a lot more going on than what you originally thought. It's there not was. just a you know it's not just a school that you don't you don't go and become a, a huntsman just for you know just for the hell of it. There mm-hmm. is a reason. Yeah. The, the world the world needs these people. Yeah, it really I think yeah I would agree. I think it really sets it. It sets the I guess you'd say it sets the tone a little bit and it really gives you a better idea of okay, this is what you're getting into when you choose to become a huntsman and you're a huntress or a huntsman. Mm-hmm. Um Isn't uh oh, go ahead. Isn't this the episode where we also get Crow in? No, that's no. volume three. Are you sure? Like I thought it was when Ironwood first comes to the Mm-mm. There's a mention of Crow in this volume, but it's a little okay. bit later on. But no, we don't see Crow until and, Volume Three, and and that's why I haven't watched uh, Volume Three yet because I didn't want to confuse myself. Rush jumped ahead of us a little bit. He has seen well, everything. Well, I as mean, said. I have, and it's just I'm looking at the because I haven't, I didn't rewatch it yesterday. Um, like the volume two, it only gives you like two sentences of summary, and I mean that's enough yes. to usually remind me. But uh, oh, there we go. Yeah, I missed that. I just I went to the next season to look, and they were all like one or one sentence ones, and so I couldn't. <laughs> yeah, I just missed. Not it. extremely like a, helpful. It's like a three. It's a it's a four line thing or a four word thing, and it's like oh, I it's easy to miss in all of the things. Anyway, yes, continuing on. But uh. A few small notes about episode two. Weiss's nickname and everyone knowing it and calling her Ice Queen is just fun. And her getting upset about it. Mm-hmm. And then uh, the board game is a fun moment as well, seeing that. Yeah. And if I'm not mistaken, I think Rooster Teeth is actually making that, that board game into a real board game, I think, or something like along those lines. So that should be fun to see and play. <laughs> but oh, um, you mentioned the intro earlier, HC. And I've, I'm going to continue to harp on this. And you said the music for it was great and everything. I still think from an animation standpoint and from an intro to an anime type show, I still feel Volume 2's intro isn't the best laid out intro or opening. And not okay. to say it's bad, but from like it kind of giving you an idea of what you're getting into and what you can expect from the volume. 
it gives you zero idea. Like talking about the opening briefly real quick, you see Blake fighting Emerald and Yang fighting Mercury in the opening. You see none of that in volume two whatsoever. They never even fight at all. It, it's stuff like that. <clears throat> it, it, it's very misleading because you think, oh, so our villains are going to have it out this volume and they never have it out actually. You know, Cinder and her two sidekicks, I guess we'll say, never have it out with our main cast. And even though we know for a fact they are villains, they never actually, our main cast never figures it out or finds it out. And there's no, nothing that goes on between any of them. Except for one brief altercation, I guess you could say. Or two brief altercations, if you, I guess you could say. But I would still say Volume 2's opening isn't in terms of giving you an idea of what you're getting into and what you can expect from the volume overall, I don't think it's the best opening. And I think later volumes do this same job better. Not to say volume two's animation, you know, the volume two opening looks good. It sounds great. I, again, I like the music as well, but it's still not the best laid out one when you flash up a bunch of screens of different characters. And I think... There's, if you count each character individually, there's like 30 different characters you're shown. Most of them you probably don't even know or remember. And some of them are barely even introduced in this, or barely even shown in this volume. So not the greatest of intros in terms of figuring out what's gonna, what this volume is going to be about. Great to okay. look at, but other than that, not so much. In my opinion, I should say. Mm -hmm. But with that said, anyone else have any thoughts on episode two? Uh, no, just things are starting to think. And okay. episode three, a minor hiccup. Okay, I know I I know you are probably told me to make a joke about it. Well, no, I'm not going to. I expected you to. I'm proud of your restraint. But I'm not proud of There's the silence. Anyway. Side um <laughs> episode three. i was uh, i i was sure i was going to make a pun about it now but okay no. i'm surprised myself <laughs> no see okay. my job is to steal the puns from you if you're going to make them so if you're not going to make them then i don't make them and this was just a bad pun to make anyways mm -hmm. or a bad joke to make mm -hmm. we just, get it we're just... how to train your dragon podcast hiccups name hiccup Ooh, wow moving on <laughs> look that's why that's I why I wasn't gonna follow. say anything. So way to kill it, Wolf. God. You're fired. Um So episode three. Um I thought this one was interesting because they're finally uh you know, sure the best day ever again, it was like introduction episode, they were having fun. Then this beacon, it's more world building than plot. Well, you still get a little bit of um a little bit of plot with Cinder, Emerald, and Mercury being at, like, you seeing them at Beacon. This one is, like, they, they realize what's going on, so they're finally doing something other than just world building. And yeah, like, we're, we're getting out of the school and seeing more Veil proper at this mm -hmm. point. Yeah. And it's, this is um, where it's, it's more plot-driven world building <clears throat> as opposed to just world building as world building mm -hmm. stuff. Which... Don't get me wrong, I like both because this is still such a huge world and I bet they could still show me a lot more in Volume 6 and I would still be impressed. But, you know, after so much of Volume 1 being just introduction and then it's nice to see them get onto something that you can kind of grab onto and follow, mm -hmm. I should say. Uh, you, if I may uh, surprise me in this episode... I didn't expect a uh, young and Neptune to go back to, to you know, to, to the yeah, to, to yeah, to the club from Yang's trailer. Like you know, that was that was an interesting thing. Like I'm saying, oh, we're back here. That's cool. And and you know, if we are talking about uh, you know characters' progression and everything, I do like how Ruby and uh, Whis are not, uh, are you know, are nice. not a uh, Weiss. I'll get it right eventually. Actually, actually, one yes. of my I talk. I started talking to one of my friends about this show. He he watched everything, so I'm talking to him about mm -hmm. it, and he made sure to correct me. And I'm still learning. I'm in the process. Well, but, okay, um, we didn't mention this last episode, but I mean, 
I don't know if, if you know HC, but all of their names are plays on words of their co- respective colors. So Blake, mm-hmm. yeah. Black, Ruby, Red, Yang, I'm guessing is, is either a, um, it could be a different language. Because like not Weiss, quite. Weiss is white in German. Weiss is snow, if I'm not mistaken, in German. It's white. It could be this. It's, it's white. Could be a it double. Yeah, it is white. Could There's be. a meaning for with snow in there as well, if I'm not mistaken. But yeah, her could color be her is last white. name maybe. But Blake is mm-hmm. purple actually. Oh I'm really? Not mistaken, not black, and it's because of Belladonna. That's the play on. Oh, color her back. There. Okay, her last name. I mean, Blake also is close to black too. Well, yeah, sure, that too. But anyway, for <laughs> Yang, what did you say Yang's was? Do you know? Yang's is basically like fire which is you know red orange yellow take your pick hmm. anyway, but yang Xiao, yang Xiao long is her full name and if i'm not mistaken it's definitely a lot of references to yellow yeah okay so um but uh so you know so so we'll be wise and i do i, I do like it that you know they started off as as enemies and everything and it is nice to see them actually de- develop this trust with each other uh, to the point that you you know when the team splits up they, they're actually working together and Weiss is not as you know she may question it sometimes but um, she is not as against Ruby as she was so I, I like that I like that it's a nice I product mean, it's a nice progression she had no intention of going with Ruby she wanted to go with Neptune but sure she definitely likes to hang out with Ruby now <laughs> <laughs> you know what I mean <laughs> yeah actually it's I definitely think, isn't, nice to see the different character that, progression yeah actually isn't it in this episode that one of the that one of the transfers or one of, that one of the guys is like suggested to go with Weiss and then and Ruby says hey, you know what no I'll go with Weiss and, he, and his, his expression I, 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 remember, I recall something funny about the expressions in this in that scene yeah, it's uh, Neptune, like I just said. It's a uh, he's okay. when Weiss says when Weiss makes the suggestion, Neptune's basically pointing at her and smiling, like, "Yeah, I agree with her." And then Ruby says, "No, Yang doesn't have a partner. I can go with you." So it makes more sense that Yang goes with Neptune, and I go with you. And yeah. his immediate expression is one of still smiling and then just being drug away by Yang. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, so that expression was important. No, it's Weiss and... that gets drug away by Ruby. Mm-hmm. <laughs> My fault. But uh, you know, you get to see some something I like. You know, a small outfit change, like the new and the other. The you know, the alternate outfit designs are really neat. I really like them. They're really cool to see, and they really. Uh, I I don't want to say clash. I want to say, they work well for the characters. I think like it's something you would expect to see from them, I guess you would say. Mm-hmm. And as Rush mentioned earlier, this feels like, this episode in particular feels very world-building. And like I think there's a lot of world-building that goes on within this particular volume, but you, know, you get the CCT and learn a little bit about that. You get to see more Veil proper. You get to see Atlas and find out that Atlas is very much kind of tech-driven kingdom very tech driven country if you will and the fact that they're trying to create soldiers to put on the you know the battlefield instead of actual people and reduce human casualties and stuff like a lot of good in my opinion really good and an interesting world building to see from this world so mm-hmm. yeah, very much a world building episode i guess you would say and also should mention you do learn because Weiss has to go to the CCT and talk to, you know, her company, you know, and get in touch with her company, uh, Schnee Dust, you do learn that Weiss, uh, you know, has some father issues, some issues with her father and everything, how she doesn't want to yeah, talk to him and stuff like yeah, that. Yeah, now that you, now that you mentioned, did, uh, I was curious about this. Is this something that's, that gets exploded later on? A little yes. bit, yeah. They, there are very little things that they don't emphasize that they don't come back to. Yeah, I would agree. I think just about everything you see them bring up in the show, you do see them bring up later on and kind of go into a bit more at some point. 
Um, so can I? One last thing I'll say is that uh, we see Penny again, who's mm-hmm. under who's under on from soldiers, and then the twist of the episode, like the cliffhanger, is that we found out Ruby finds out she's a robot, and mm-hmm. you know, did you see con- this one coming? Consi- yeah, I consider in how the last season ended and the things that Penny did there, I would have been I would have been more surprised if she wasn't a robot. <laughs> I mean, the way she acts alone, pretty much. Like the second I saw her, the fur in the volume one, like the very second she acts the way she acts, like she's not human, she's a robot. I don't know why. Like I think everyone just immediately like it's very obvious, I think, that everyone's gonna think, okay, mm-hmm. robot. You don't even think Faunus, you just immediate robot. She's a robot. <laughs> it's very, and it's a twist that I think everyone saw coming. But I mean, it's not something they like tried to hide really well or anything like that. I think they were very on the nose with it. But it's not like a terrible twist or anything of that nature. Mm-hmm. It's an interesting thing to see. And I think it, again, it adds to this world. Like she's a robot that can use aura and has a semblance. Or at the very least, she can use aura, anyways. Very interesting. Yeah, the, although the th- I think the thing with the aura is explained more in the next episode. A little bit. Mm-hmm. But mm-hmm, rolling right along, episode four of Painting the Town. Yeah. So um, mm-hmm. I, I will say that I like who he just accepts the fact that Penny is a robot, and I, not in a sort not in a sort of sarcastic manner. I just you know. Yeah, you know, we're all friends. So I don't know. I like this. It was a cute moment. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it it works between the two of them, and it's really nice to see. And it, it just you know shows you more and more of Ruby's character in that she's very much I don't care. We're friends. That's all that matters to me. Mm-hmm. Very mm-hmm. simple. Very straightforward from her. Yeah. Um, but in this okay, episode, qu- oh, go ahead. Yeah, question Is this the episode that ends with Tim Ruby fighting that uh, huge machine? Yes, yes, the okay, giant so- paladin robot that is controlled by Roman Torchwood. Yeah, so that entire fight was awesome. Mm-hmm. Did you hear all of the different call outs for, t- for c- combination moves? Mm-hmm. Um, <laughs> Here and there, I, I, if you ask me to point them out by name, I can tell you, but I, I recall them doing something like this. This is the show doing something fun, because I think most of these combination moves, uh, or a few of the combination moves anyways, are some of the ship names that you have for the different characters in their ships. And if I'm not mistaken, I could be wrong, but if I'm not mistaken, these ship names were thought of before the show used them in this volume. So... Oh. This is the show having fun. Mm-hmm. Oh, you know, it could also just... You know... Uh-oh. Sorry, viewers, but I believe my audio has cut out. I will be right back. It, but, it, reminded me of some, it reminded me of something else. It doesn't matter. I'll, I won't go into this. So, mm-hmm. we get to... <laughs> and I just leave? That was a joke that I well don't fully understand. I, the viewers won't fully understand what just happened, so my internet died. However, I was still in oh. the chat. I was still in the uh, Burtcast channel. I just couldn't hear anything. And Uh then, so I switched my Wi-Fi, because it's usually when that happens, I just have to switch from a 5G to a 2G. And then I came back, and I could hear you guys, and then I just got kicked out of the channel for some reason. So I rejoined (laughs) for a quick... And you guys kept talking like nothing had happened. No, I thought that was... I just... (laughs) has not say so far, so... That's why we need to have everybody record their audio again, like we used to do. Oh, 
So there's going to be uh, a very large blank spot there. Well, Oof. I I noticed it, and I'm like, uh oh. And so I told the viewers, I said, I said to the viewers, I'm like, my internet may have died, viewers. And so, <laughs> anyway, what so were you guys talking spot, about? In short, we were paint. We were talking about episode four, painting the town. What was the last okay. bit that you got? Um, that Ruby was the accepting friend, I believe. Okay, so you heard the bit about Penny. So you've not missed mm -hmm. too, too much, really. Yeah. We talked about, the, you know, the... Oh, no, no, we talked... I, I remember talking about destroying the Paladin, right? <laughs> so yeah. we, I basically, we talked about the whole episode up until... I don't think we got to his escape with... Uh, as her name is apparently Neo. Neapolitan. The shortest mm -hmm. character in the entire show, by the way. Literally the shortest character in the entire show. Yeah, I I was looking okay. at the character descriptions after I watched the whole season. Some of them were just freaking tall, man. Yeah, some of them. <laughs> like Jean's almost six foot, by the way. Damn, six. Yeah. What? <laughs> Neo is four foot nine. <laughs> she is small. Everyone in the show is taller than Neo. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, you know, you say Adam that she's Forrest small like six, compared six. to, they, you know, you say you say like she's small. I think and like that's that's probably the most average average height character in Four this show. Not average. <laughs> if she was five foot something, then we'd be we, then we'd be talking about average. And Four foot nine is not average. You say in the show, eight C. Okay. People in the show, I'm like all the show. of the, it, as is one thing that I have constant issues with as is in classical animation all the adults are always taller than the main characters of the show so like mm -hmm. you have yeah ozpin is like six four or something like that crow yeah. is like six three or something like that i mean they're all just giants juniors like six foot something as well like mm -hmm. he's one of the tallest characters in the show yeah but i mean that makes a little bit of sense for his character but yeah. that dude is huge in terms of height he would tower over most people in real life. Mm -hmm. But yeah, she is small. She is literally the smallest person in the show. But nothing wrong with that. It's just funny to see a little bit. Fun fact. Yeah, fun fact, if you will. But we do get to learn for episode four, we get to learn more about the White Fang a little bit here and how they're recruiting people and kind of what their plan is a little bit. Mm -hmm. Which is, again, a little bit more world building kind of through plot as well because it gives our characters a motivation to want to go somewhere again outside of Vale. And, you know, this gives them reason to do so because they know, okay, this is where they're going to be at. This is the location they're going for and things of that nature. You know, we learn more of their plans and we want to know more about that. It gives us a goal in mind, which is nice to see. Mm -hmm. But yeah, agreed. Like the entire fight scene with the paladin is just, just good to watch. It's just good, a good fight scene to see and watch. Mm -hmm. It's engaging and, for lack of a better word, again, good to watch. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, just uh, just a great, and all great shows have. It should point out, right? Like, again, I said this earlier and I'm going to say it again. I think the show uses semblances a lot better this time around because you see Sun use his semblance and you can very easily tell, okay, this is his semblance. And the same with Yang, you kind of learn more about what her semblance is, mm -hmm. you know, and you get to clearly see it being used now and it you can note the difference between her using it and her not using it. Very. I think a good thing to see from the show because they're learning, okay, we need to make this more clear because it very much wasn't clear in the first season, I think. Mm -hmm. Any other thoughts on uh, this? Um, I'm ready to move on to the next one if you guys are. Yeah. Okay. Episode five, extracurricular. We start off mm -hmm. with Pira fighting four different people. <laughs> if I'm not mistaken. And very clearly denoting that she is very good. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And if I'm not mistaken, this is the one where we see... Actually, I do want to say, I do the opening to this episode. Like, you know, again, we see how well Pira is, but... 
but uh, you know and then and then i uh, me bad guy everything what's his name um who now one one of the two we saw in episode one who killed you know the um, oh mercury the is who you're talking mercury. about yeah yeah so what i about? i liked him like I liked it. I liked him volunteering to the fight in the class, and then like when you think Pierre might have the upper hand, he 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 surrenders, and mm-hmm. I don't know. There there was something about there was something about that fight. There was something about him tapping out and then you know saying it may actually be fun. I don't know. It was so, it was it's a good way to set up a villain. In my opinion, yeah, I like it, it. It very much shows like he's very cocky and he's very confident in himself. And mm-hmm. even when he gives up, you get this feeling like he very much thinks he could have taken her easily. She would have never beaten him. And you know, you very much that's the feeling he gives off the entire time. And just to mm-hmm. see him give up like that, it's very much okay. You really think highly of yourself, and and seeing how he handled Pira compared to. Her being able to take on four people who are, even if they're not as good as others in the class, they're still four huntsmen in training, still been training most of their lives to be huntsmen, right? And so they're still very talented in their own right as well. Seeing her take on all four of them and easily beating them and then having a bit of trouble with Mercury very much shows that whether it's deserved or not, he's, you know, whether he could have taken her or not, he's very much, he definitely is in another league compared to who she just fought mm-hmm. before. Mm-hmm. And in this mm-hmm. episode, we get to see more of Blake really pushing herself extremely hard to solve things. And you can see kind of the visible effect that's having on her. Yeah. Um, actually, is the, this is the episode about a setting up the that uh, ball right yes the dance yeah this mm-hmm. episode we first hear about it and then the next two episodes are focused on the dance after this yeah okay Is that um, all or do you need... <laughs> I t- no i'm it seems like you're going somewhere because yeah. because i'm trying to i'm trying to because, like you said, there are there are more episodes surrounding the the ball. But um, I, I know this is the one where Blake, where Blake is actually is, is saying that how can we organize this thing when we are trying to get more information about uh, the bank thing and we have a mission. How can we just forget it and and mm-hmm. uh, and all? And uh, is this the? But the ball is not this episode. It's the no, next that's... one, right? It's the one. It's episode seven is when the dance actually is in full swing. The next episode is still them more or less planning the dance. Mm-hmm. But uh, uh, talking about this episode, I personally uh, should mention poor Jean. I think it was yeah. It was a nice to me personally. I got a decent little laugh out of seeing him play the guitar and asking why to the dance, and her saying no. I got a nice little laugh out of that personally. I really enjoyed that. Mm-hmm. I don't know if anyone else did, but again, that's just me. I enjoyed that little laugh. That was yeah. fun to see. And John yeah. improved training is also, mm-hmm. it's interesting to see because you learn, you know, that John is improving. He is getting better and he's using, and, you know, and he's training with Pira in order to do so. Mm-hmm. And you get to see John not getting it or taking the hint either. Yeah, that uh, Pira may actually And then, <laughs> oh man! Cla- classic, high- classic high yeah. school. High- yeah, it is. Mm-hmm. But yeah, I think the big, I think the big thing for this episode is definitely like hearing how frustrated Blake is. That well, it, it kind of starts a little bit in this episode and goes into the next episode, especially. And I guess, is there any more thoughts on episode five? Uh, personally, no. I got what I want to say, Chris. Rush, you've uh, been a little bit quiet. Mostly because I, <laughs> my internet. I don't want it to. I don't know why me talking would affect it, but 
That's a you don't want it to lag. <laughs> yeah. been there, I know. <laughs> I'm trying to focus on the internet, even though I have absolutely no hand in it. Um, this one I do like. Uh, wait, we're oh episode six. For some reason, my eyes just went out of focus, and I saw a five, a six. I'm like, wait, wait a second. Why are we still on painting the town? Um, but yeah, I do like how the they find out um Pira's semblance based off of the fight that's one thing that i thought was kind of cool mm -hmm. yeah you get to see um mercury basically he chose to fight pyrrha simply just to find out her semblance mm -hmm. <laughs> and again it's just kind of goes back to that what are the villains planning we're learning more a bit a little bit a little bit by little bit what their plan is and exactly what it is they want to do and also just getting to see they really are like these are major threats these villains are on a you know, these three are on a different level compared to Torchwick and the White Fang and Neo essentially. You know, they're on mm -hmm. a different level and they very much have a plan that they're going for and gunning for and that they want to achieve compared to the other villains we've seen up to this point. Mm -hmm. yeah, but uh, just agree. Moving on, episode six, burning the candle. Um Okay, again, the the ball doesn't start start yet. It's still. I know why you're tonight. so set on that. I'm sure I know exactly what you want to mention, but no, the ball starts episode seven. Episode six, we're still getting there. Okay. <laughs> episode so six still is getting where. I I wonder if you talk about because there is something about the ball episode. Actually, you know, looking at the list, yeah, what I want to talk about is in the next episode. So. Mm -hmm. And I, I'm, I'm, I think I know what it'll be, but we'll see. But we'll see. for episode six, I think the big thing is learning about you know Yang and I guess to a degree Ruby's past, but especially for Yang and how she feels and oh her yeah, have the talk she yeah. has with Blake. This is where we kind of see. This is where Crow gets mentioned, by the way, and this is where we see kind of an image of Crow. Um, actually, you know, quick question: What do you think uh, yeah, about the actually... style change for that? Because <clears throat> that okay. was done completely uh, differently style-wise. Yeah, two things I mentioned. The backstory Yan tells Blake about her and Ruby, and you know how she had to run with, with her to find her mother. The one I love the art style. I always love when the, when shows like this two flashbacks as they kind of switch the art style in mm -hmm. order to reflect something old. So I like it as well. And also the story itself is just you know it hits you. It hits. That's um, mm -hmm. that's how much you can tell I like this when it's actually hidden me. But then when Blake um, talks about uh, her partner, her partner from the trailer, I'm like, oh yeah, he was the thing. I kind of forgot about him. <laughs> <laughs> He'll be a thing later too. Oh, okay. <laughs> yep. Can we imagine the voice actor being like, oh, okay, I'm showing up. Awesome. It's funny that you mentioned the voice actor when very few people, I think, actually like his voice that he gives okay. the character. Really? They don't like <laughs> his voice? Yeah, a lot of people have problems with him being... You, I don't... I guess you've seen the other volume, so you, ha you, have an ex you have an idea of this, but a lot of people think he tries... He, he has a very consistent tone of emotion, and that tone of emotion is kind of a little bit edgy mixed with a little bit creepy and in some scenes that really works and in others it doesn't and a lot of people have an issue with that personally oh boy. i i don't but I many do yeah and I, I understand where they're coming from but again it's something we'll get into in i later just think volumes. it fits the character like uh, not, i think it does not too. this design i think it does like, as well but many people not, would disagree uh, with us mm -hmm. Yeah, I know it's that it's not in this franchise, but I know exactly what you're talking about, Wolf. I also have this opinion on an like edgy on an edgy, somewhat dark voice for a character that a lot that everyone doesn't like, but I somewhat I'm somewhat okay with it. Well, we'll see how you feel about Adam then going forward. Yeah, <laughs> mm -hmm. but. Yeah, I think you know. Again, like I think it's we we see a little bit of comedy in the side with Jean and Ren, and Jean pulling Ren off to the side to talk to him while Ren's completely naked, essentially. And 
Rin. Yeah. And really, there is no talk there. It's more or less just John talking at Rin. <laughs> a fun little thing. And then Nora's also still in the room. Nora is, <laughs> Nora is one of my favorite characters. She's Absolutely. After, after the later seasons. Nora's a lot of fun. Mm-hmm. Hands down, I, I would agree. Definitely a fun character. And poor Pyrrha. Mm-hmm. Again, telling John, go after Weiss. You know, <laughs> just tell her how you feel. Uh, yeah, that, that was heartbreaking, <laughs> I, I have you to all. admit. Like, you know, again, you know something about this cliche that for some reason, um, I've seen it so many times, but at the same, but then again, every time this happens, depends on depends on the show and how much I care. But you can tell I care when this uh, when this actually. I, I'm like, no, no. <laughs> um, another fun joke to point out that is expected, but I think they handled it okay. Is the laser pointer, considering Blake's a cat faunus. Mm-hmm. A nice little joke. Oh yeah, <laughs> yeah. That 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 was uh, that was. I wanted I wanted to ask you about this as soon as I saw this. Like, was this intentional or? It was. It, just... it was. No, okay. it's, it's literally Yang doing it. Probably a little bit racist if you think about it. Considering. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you know something in a universe like this, and what is it with this with this show and the season in general reminded me of Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. What what is up with that? But I won't get into this. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Um, <laughs> there's a there's a great scene in next season that relates to. Oh no! Like being, I know you, what you're you know, talking yeah, about. <laughs> it's so. Funny. Okay, don't spoil I'm this for me. It, and just for... Saying, they don't they don't forget to like sure they they don't forget that Blake is a faunus, but they also use it as like they also remind you in fun ways they don't make you feel yeah, bad every they, time they the, yeah they use the idea of faunus that you know and them being and them having animal traits and them being kind of you know based on animals they use it in a fun way a lot of the times and it's mm-hmm. fun to see mm-hmm. fun faunus as a matter of fact there's another scene in this very in this very volume that we'll see a little bit later that they use it as well that i can point out that'll be fun to talk about mm-hmm. but yeah definitely episode six the big thing is yang and blake's talk and see, and hearing and seeing the style change and hearing yang talk about her past and getting mm-hmm. to see you know a little bit of their uncle and how he came to save the day for them <clears throat> and how yang was so driven to find her mom right. and it's very it's a very touching scene because yeah. it's very much by, by the way mm-hmm. does this come into play later the thing with the mother yes okay it does mm-hmm did As you watch the post credit scenes for this season? We'll get to it later, but just asking if you did, AC. Okay. Uh, actually, I mean, like, if it's something that uh, builds upon in the in the future seasons, because oh yeah, I do remember it, something oh, in the post credits. Yeah. Okay. Oh yeah. Okay. It, oh, yeah. Mm-hmm. It, it yeah, it absolutely. Like you'll see, you'll see more of her mom. You know, you'll get and, to kind of see a little bit more of their relationship. And with don't worry, another. they they won't spring it on you or anything like that. Okay, no, I'm not worrying about uh, springing them springing this on me. I'm just, I'm just curious. That's all. Mm-hmm. Did you yeah, see what fair. I did there, Wolf? Mm-hmm. Nice. <laughs> <sighs> okay, you two, you two will ha- can have your puns, <laughs> and I'll just remember that not only do you two making puns, there are puns that I can get because I'm not at that point of the show yet. It's so for the audience this time, HC. Yeah, We're thinking no. of so the technically, but, but technically, your oh, puns are lost with their mind because not everyone involved is going to get them. So, ha. Huh? But those that do, though, HC. They will enjoy it a lot. <laughs> but if yeah, you yeah. say so. <clears throat> but I guess uh, with all of that said, moving on to the episode HC's been wanting to talk about, considering he keeps asking about it. Episode 7, Dance Dance Infiltration. Okay, so before I actually talk about I want to, what what is your, uh, what what is the part you thought I want to talk to about? I'm assuming you want to talk about the dance itself that Team Juniper does, and them dancing, you know, Jean, Pira, Ren, and Nora. Jean in a dance um, well. I I wanted, but I just my personal favorite moment, and it's kind of a meeting, and I'll explain. Is that when Ruby sees the um, it's it's Cinder that infiltrates the 
Academy, right? Oh, never mind. I know what you want to talk about now. <laughs> I bet. <laughs> yes, it's Cinder. <clears throat> okay. Go ahead. Okay, so you know, I when the when the quote unquote, the villain is um, is you know um, infiltrates the academy during a dance so that everyone is occupied, and Ruby is the one that catches this and actually and and she doesn't just dismiss it. She goes after her, and she actually puts oh. on. She doesn't. She doesn't necessarily succeed in stopping her, but she does put up a fight. And mm. I, and I like that idea. I I just like this type of character that uh, people that know me either from the Burkas or just in the real life know that I am a huge Spider-Man guy. And this was pretty much a Spider-Man moment. Like I can stay in and I can stay here and hang out with my friends, but I have this responsibility that that I need to take care of. And I'll go and try my best to stop a, a threat. So that, that was just a fun thing for me to see. And I like that. That, that. that wasn't necessarily a responsibility she had to take care of. That was more and that she didn't want to hang out and that she wanted to hang out with her friends but couldn't or didn't. It was more so she wanted to get out of the dance because she didn't want to be in the dance. Well, it's, it's still good it's, to it's, show that, right? Because yeah. it still shows that little bit of you know, Ruby's still very socially awkward and she doesn't like, you know, major social situations like that. And then she's going to try and get out of them if she can and sneak away. Yeah, but and she did just yeah, that. I, I know what you, I know what you, but let's be honest. Uh, as sh I, I'm not sure about you guys, but I was socially awkward. Uh, but at mm -hmm. the same time, I would, I would prefer to stay in the, de in the dance hall and just uh, watch people dance then go out and fight someone like in terms of you know preference so that that's different kinda... worlds though make a difference here <laughs> but you know what I... remember they're training uh, they're, tra you know they're literally you know going to write. school to learn to fight better so the point is <laughs> you know what i get across i just i just like the stuff that because i understand what you're saying any, yeah. any other any other show could just you know, I'm seeing this, but at the same time, something something tells me that I should stay here. And then they like play it up on why didn't you do anything? No, no, no. The character does something, so thank God for that. Not, I should admit, not what I thought you were going to talk about when it came to this episode, and not what I thought you were going to mention when it came to when you when you said seeing Cinder infiltrate and running across the rooftops. I figured you were going to point out like the really kind of choppy animation from it and everything. I figured well, that's what you were going to talk well, about, so I'm surprised. You know, we kind of we kind of mentioned that in season one that the animation is a bit choppy, and you know, again, mm -hmm. it, this is an indie pro the, for all intents and purposes, this is an indie production, so I'm not feeling I'm not feeling right with with criticizing them for something that they're still learning at this well, like it, time. I, like I said, like right, it is something mm -hmm. you will see improvement on every single volume. Yeah, hands. Yeah, down. and I see the improvements. Mm -hmm. a bit and, choppy, you know, yeah, and, yeah, but, and, the, but I, I don't feel right criticizing them because, again, they're learning. And yeah. I can do better myself, <clears throat> honestly. So the, yeah. fact that, <laughs> the fact that they managed to do this is... Could yes. not animate a rock, so they already are better than me. Exactly. But I guess the big thing for this is... We finally get to see Jean and Pira having, you know, a moment and Jean yeah. finally getting it a little bit, you know, and yeah. him actually doing something nice for Weiss as well and saying, hey, Neptune, you know, go talk to her. And, you know, we get to hear a little bit about Neptune telling Weiss that and everything and seeing kind of Weiss have a slightly better appreciation for Jean here as well. Yeah. And, you know, any person that can walk up to dance hall filled with people with this dress kind of kind of <laughs> earns my my respect and it was also nice to see you know the big dance moment for them that was fun to watch mm -hmm. and just a and fun moment in general the show just having fun actually, and like, hey, let's animate this and do this yeah okay that's something i want to ask you if, uh, maybe rush could answer this as well because it's far, a bit more far ahead in the show but um there's a po there's a point where uh, uh, that Blake again does. Uh, we established that, but um, that Blake, you know, uh, that Blake what now? Your mic cut out. Blake Blake doesn't want to go to the dance. Like she has <laughs> yeah. no interest in it. And mm -hmm. Young kind of convinces her, and she tells her, 
I'll I'll save you a dance when mm-hmm. when you get there, and and they do dance together. I have, this is where the ship was born. Um, no, the ship was two. born way before this. The ship was born oh. volume one, because people mm-hmm. love the ship. <laughs> okay, because I, I when I said to myself, okay, if people didn't ship and fall this, this is the point. But this yeah, this is... definitely helped a lot. Mm-hmm. Just as every little moment between any character helps for a ship, because that's how shipping like, works. Yeah, they were like two characters can... together. As yeah. someone They're who, shipped. Yeah, no, this is. But uh, I, I'm telling you, as someone who makes music videos in his uh, spare time, um, shameless plug, HCSP one on YouTube. Go look, <laughs> go look them up. Um, oh, the, I'm sorry, if the I, audio I, randomly it, cut out at that moment. Mm-hmm. Yeah, wow. Who, who would have thought? Well, I said myself from being a sellout. Yay. Um, but what I'm, tr- but what I'm trying to say is that if if you told me that I make a like a music video about these two with the ship, then yeah, I would use this episode, no doubt in my mind. Mm-hmm. Yeah, definitely fair. And you and you'll get and I promise you, you will get more moments to use for something like you would get many more moments to use for something like that as well oh boy mm-hmm. um, went on to that the are that yeah and you know every moment like again this is how shipping works right like every moment you see is not something that is built up romantically it's built up their teammates their friends the yeah. show isn't as of right now the show has never built it as build it as anything romantic fans have and that's where the ship's been born from but mm-hmm. and I and there's nothing wrong with that. Before you know, b- particular ship fans decide they want to come and hang me at the stake and and burn me at the stake and you know hang me, there's nothing wrong with that. But mm-hmm. nothing has been billed as romantic. It's all been billed as team focused and coming together and being closer as friends and teammates and learning to work with one another and have a greater appreciation and understanding for one another. Which is good to see, and you need to see that for a show like this because they are teammates. You know, they are a team of four, and they need to come closer. And it's nice to see moments like that where they are getting closer and they are having more fun with one another and relaxing more and kind of lowering that barrier that they've put up for themselves because these are teenagers, and teenagers do have those walls put up to protect themselves and keep themselves safe, right? And it's nice to see... Or these mm-hmm. characters in their small teams, it's nice to see them take these walls down slowly but surely as they come closer. Like in this one, we learn, you know, when Jean's dancing with Pierre, and you can see that Jean can dance really well. You know, he takes down that wall a little bit to mention that he has seven sisters. Holy crap. Mm-hmm. This poor kid. <laughs> seven <laughs> sisters. But I mean, you know what? That that actually... Kinda... Yeah, the, the loud house telling Jean. Well, that kind of it, it. It might make sense just from a like, and I would totally buy it. And I can't remember if they've actually said it. Oh yeah, he said he was the youngest too, because that makes it seem like the family I don't think was he's the youngest. Okay, that would have made it seem like the family was yeah. going for a son. I could be wrong, but I don't think he's the youngest. I could be very wrong with that though. Do not quote me on that at all. Mm-hmm. I don't think they've mm-hmm. mentioned anywhere that he is the, you know, the, the the youngest. I don't think so, but he very well could be. And it it would make sense, right, considering this world, considering he even mentions that, you know, his father was, you know, a, a quote-unquote hero or a huntsman, and so was his grandfather. They, you know, his grandfather even fought in the Great War and all that. <clears throat> so it makes sense that, you know, they would, that his father would want a son to kind of pass down that tradition onto, right? Mm-hmm. And it kind of goes along with the world and everything as well. So, yeah, but it, 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 nice stuff to learn, though. And I think, I guess, the big thing is one thing I definitely want to mention a fun moment that I really enjoy from the show is seeing Cinder, you know, HC brought this up, seeing her infiltrating and her fighting and then her taking out all of those guards and then just the two guards coming down the elevator and Cinder just walks onto the elevator. Just no shits given. Just, hey. Yeah. I'm just going to join you. Let's go up now. <laughs> mm-hmm. That's a very good, like, I think that really shows her off so, as a villain. Very so before well. we begin, does that, does anyone want to want to leave? <laughs> oh, 
I get the joke now. That one flew over my head for a second. I, I guess it. I guess it. <laughs> but yeah, it was overall a good episode and a good. This is definitely kind of getting away from the plot a little bit, yeah. but it also like the first. This is like a small. I guess you'd say the dance arc. It's a very small arc. It's three episodes, and it kind of gets yeah. away from the plot a little bit, but it does eventually bring everything back to that. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And if uh, we're done, I don't want to connect to what I liked about this episode to the next one. Okay. It, I guess moving right along. Does you have to? Uh, one. Do you have anything to say, Rush? Or you good? No, I'm good with moving on. All right. Episode eight: Field Trip. Yeah. Um, so in you know this uh, this picks up right after the previous episode. And I do like the conversation that Ozpin mm -hmm. have with with um, Ruby about how you know about how she acted and mm -hmm. that she and that she took action because you know on the one hand yeah Cinder got away but they they do acknowledge that Ruby is still in, is still learning and the fact she went after Cinder after all and didn't just dismiss it was was a way of them to tell. That she is, and that she is Huntsman material. Mm -hmm. Again, again, it's something because a lot of other shows would play it off as, "How could you fail after everything we taught you?" And no, this actually felt like a really realistic and really, and in a sense, good way to you know motivate your students. So mm -hmm. in a sense, uh, so I like that. It's also I, nice I like to that, see... and I like. Oh, go ahead. No, go ahead. I I'm so okay. it, it just on that moment. I I guess I'll mention really quick. It's nice to see how fast Osmond can catch on, right? Mm -hmm. And see that he very quickly catches on to when Ruby mentions, you know, hey, I did hear her mention a thing about they're planning something to the southeast of Vale. You know, she very quickly mentions that offhandedly, and Osmond very quickly like. Okay, you know more than you're letting on. Sure, I'll let you get away with this, and we'll kind of see where this goes with you. A nice little tidbit, mm -hmm. I think. You know, seeing his reaction to that and how he just, you know, that little quick smirk slash smile from him. Yeah. Um, I guess so. The next thing I do want to say is that the the missions they start getting in the in this place are to are that they are actually. Um, they actually send on uh, into the field with a professional with professional with professional huntsmen. Mm -hmm. that, that's uh, again that's something that in this type of school and what they're teaching. That's a very important and good thing to learn. Mm -hmm. uh, but the one thing also I get is that you know how I talked about Ruby being kind of responsible in the last episode. Yeah, taking your dog to this uh, to this assignment in your backpack is not the most is not the most as a um, dog owner. Just saying. I think the professional huntsman would completely disagree with you because he says it's a great idea, and it was a great idea. Thank you very much. And he, very responsible. Well, <laughs> well, it, it, well, it doesn't. I mean, it's not hey, responsible. no, it later in the episode or later in a different episode. I just want to say he freaking bats the dog. Yes, he uses him as a. He uses the cat. He uses the. He uses the dog as a cannonball. He even yeah. the dog didn't light on fire on his own. He so lit the dog on to fire too. So are you to pro animal? What the hell is wrong with you? <laughs> the dog the is food. fine. The dog literally goes out of his way to join him again. By the way, so the dog liked it. <laughs> Should admit. Should point out. <laughs> yeah. Okay, fair well. enough. Fair the enough. The dog we're talking about, we should point out, is why. And should also point out, if you want to talk about dog abuse, this dog was sent in the mail by a tube. Yeah, poor thing. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, if we're talking about dog abuse, let's talk about how Ruby and Yang's dad very much into dog abuse too, considering he mailed their dog to them via a tube, which also had about a pile of dog food in it as well. And a can opener. Should admit that also is why apparently knows how to use a can opener somehow too. Mm -hmm. But this well, is very well. much a, this is the show having fun again. Zwei is great. 
it's you know very interesting like there are animals in this it's nice to see like hey there are animals in this they do have dogs and stuff like that actual animals and it's not just the faunus quote unquote replace the animals right it's like they do have actual animals too and this is where we get to see a bit of that and we get to see why who's just a lot of fun and we get to see everyone's reactions to him it's kind of you know it's very adorable to see how weiss treats why immediately and how she just accepts him immediately and stuff of that nature. Mm -hmm. And like I said earlier, I would point this out. How you see Blake move the second she sees the dog and finds out he's a dog. She's immediately up on top of her bunk acting like a cat would act, you know, or how you would think a cat would act around a dog. Yeah, that, that was actually funny. So it's very, you know, a very cute little thing to see. Mm -hmm. I think... Uh, the big one here is we learn a little bit more about the Great War, and we learn about, as Rush said before, you know, the the names of color and the self-expression thing and how people name their kids after color, right, and how that plays a part. And the show's not very good about doing this, right? But we do learn that as a full semester – in this episode, we learned that a full semester has passed at this point, right? Like Osborne mm -hmm. actually mentions last semester. And I think this is something that the – entirety of ruby isn't that great at doing and i and i mentioned this for race to the edge too like they're not very good at showing time passing or showing how much time has passed and <laughs> this is a good way to kind of get that across but this is the first and only mention we get that at least one semester within ruby has passed and this is apparently their second semester so an interesting thing to note yeah any thoughts okay. you two would like to share i just want to say um... that his name is is two in german in german yeah mm -hmm. and it's a uh it's definitely a reference to ein from cowboy bebop yeah whose name is one, one in, in german. german and also a corgi <laughs> yes hc probably does not have any idea who ein is but that's fine <laughs> <laughs> well i'll probably know in the start because we do mm -hmm. when ein's not a part of ruby ein is from cowboy bebop but completely d oh. a different show yeah, okay, I know that it's in that long list that I need to get to. But <laughs> anyway, shall we yeah. shall we move on? For... Yeah, this is definitely a smaller episode that sets up, you know, our next pretty much big arc. Like this is the yeah. last, I guess. You'd say and the one. final arc for. Yeah, this is the final arc for Volume Two, and this is pretty much the setup for it. Like, hey, we're going off on a field trip. This is Team Ruby accepts their mission to go to the southeast and check out. Um, you know the <clears throat> what the White Fang are doing down there with yes. our professional hunter Ublek, my favorite teacher at Beacon. Yes, <laughs> and you yeah, see I why like as him. we roll. Oh, go ahead. I like him. He, he's funny, and you'll see why right as we roll right along into Episode Nine: Search and Destroy. Mm -hmm. Any thoughts? Mm -hmm. uh, honestly, it, there was not a lot. Say I enjoyed the episode, but you know it just they start they start um, they start the mission they they fight for a bit they find a hideout. The episode ends, so there, there's not much to say. And but... I think there is because the, the focus on this episode, right, is showing how Ublek as a teacher challenges his students, right? Like you see him specifically go out of his way to ask Yang, Blake, and Weiss. Why do you want to become a huntress? Mm -hmm. What is your goal? Mm -hmm. What are you planning on achieving? And it's very important. And it's very important because you get to hear their answers and what they think. And then you also get to see how they how they feel later on and how they deliberate about that and how they come to the conclusion that what we want from being a huntress is secondary to what we have to do. Right. And you see when they come to that conclusion, you see Oop like, you know, you know, casually smile as he's listening into their conversation from above when they're resting for the night and <clears throat> you know, you get to hear and see that and it's very much, okay. So he's very much using this as another teaching experience for his students. He's trying to still yet even now teach them. And yeah. you know, you realize he doesn't ask Ruby that because he knows he doesn't need to, right? He immediately recognizes she wants to be the hunt. She wants to be a huntress because she solely wants to help people. She's in it for nothing else. The other three, they had their own reasons for doing so. They had their own wants that they wanted to achieve by becoming huntresses. And through his questioning, you're right. They learned that they, they no longer that 
that is what they want is not what they, uh, what they want is not as important as what they need to do mm, what their responsibility as is as and is when becoming huntresses and taking up this mantle and this job yes and it's a very fun thing to see and that's more i would say this is definitely the focus of this episode and you get to see something we mentioned earlier right like boob like telling ruby like greens why was a great idea and how he treats the dog is fun and just how he acts in general is always fun very hyperactive always drinking coffee rush probably loves this character solely because of that <laughs> it definitely carries a large thermos points. around yeah no, with coffee definitely it was a it was a big thing for me i really liked it um because just the the pure fact that he was not only was he a doctor uh, I'm just kidding. Uh, he was <laughs> he was not just like what normal shows would do for a professor or doctor of his stance, where he seems really, really into learning. But mm -hmm. they would just a lot of other shows would just focus on that. Like say, let's say Fish Legs, his learning. He would go out of his way to learn something, but he wouldn't have a purpose to it. He would do it for the pure sake of learning, like. Oob, like, he wants mm -hmm. to know, but he also wants to teach the kids along the way. And he mm -hmm. can also fight like hell, also unlike fish like um, <laughs> So We'll get to that a little bit later. Mm -hmm. But, yeah, it's definitely good to see as well as, yeah, and the thing, like, right, like, he teaches Ruby. Like, we learned a very interesting fact about the Grim as well in this episode where not all Grim are just mindless killing machines. They do... They have grown, they have learned, and that there are extremely old Grimm, and they can live for a very long time if they're not killed, right? Mm -hmm. And through that, they've learned that <clears throat> they have no need. Like, they see that we see these giant, basically, you know, mammoth Grimm, you know, elephants. Elephants, mm -hmm. mammoth, take your pick. They're giant Grimm. And Ruby's yeah. very immediate reaction is, okay, let's fight them, let's kill them. And he's like, no, we don't need to do that. That would be useless for us to do it because taking on all of them would be hard to say the least. So there's no need for us to do so. We're not going to bother with that. Even they're not going to attack us. You know, and she's like, you know, and hearing that and seeing that and then hearing her even, you know, and hearing Ruby herself ask him, why did you want to become a huntress? And his, uh, a huntress. Why did you want to become a huntsman? Right. And, he, you know, his answer is, I want to help people by learning how we can better survive learning from our past mistakes like mountain glen and this is you know something we should mention mountain glen a failed expansion they tried to expand outside the borders of Vale, which had natural protection to that it could rely on <clears throat> mountain glen didn't have that and so mountain glen failed as an expansion because it was overrun by grim and this is also where we learn that the grim are attracted to you know negativity negative emotions mm -hmm. you know very this is very much you know again a world building episode a world building episode that's used to that it, the plot takes a back seat for this episode and it's very much focused on building up the world and giving you a greater understanding of what the grim are and what their purpose is and why they're doing what they're doing and why they're attracted and, and all of that <clears throat> for me this is definitely one of my favorite episodes of the volume considering i'm very big into world building mm -hmm. and character development and you yep. get that in spades from this episode and i'll also a bit of the next yeah a bit of the next episode as well mm -hmm. <clears throat> i mean like we said with the last ep um birdcast episode a lot of these episodes tie in together so like basically the last uh Basically, episode nine through twelve are all together. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, absolutely. I would agree. Like, it's all just this is one arc for itself. Mm -hmm. Anything so, else to say about? I guess moving on into episode ten, Mountain yeah. Glen. Mm -hmm. So again, in terms of the bit of back and for Blake again. Weiss as uh, as uh, all in beneath uh, the fire, the fireplace, and you know just them talking. Uh, a small moment where you know it's their first mission. It's um, it's their first mission as a team. They're ready to start. You know, mo moving on in the ranks. 
I guess you could say. And it was interesting to see them share this experience together. And then, and, and then goes, Ruby going to... Go ahead. Goes right along too. No, I just said it in, and nice to see Ruby, you know, go, kind of going on on her own, in a sense. Mm -hmm. And, mm -hmm. and, and then finding out, uh, finding out what's the, that she kind of she doesn't she, that she doesn't necessarily need the team in order to find out stuff. She can do this on her own as well, which you know I I like the team the team uh, come up. I, I do I do like the team team <clears throat> you know te teams working together in this in this. But it's also important to see that a person can be uh, useful on his own without the team. And mm -hmm. I think and I think. There is there is a reason, and and I think that that shows, that shows that you know she does contribute something, even if she gets captured. It's it's still it's still you know she's out in the field and she's doing stuff. She's she's not afraid. She's not afraid to, you know, move move things along. I like oh, that. Should... You should point. You should definitely like talking about that, right? Like, there's also something you learn about Ruby, and this I think is also really good to note and see is that these characters, they have their strengths, right? That they are like Ruby's an excellent fighter when it comes to using her scythe, but mm -hmm. without her scythe, mm -hmm. even people who she would normally beat very easily, like this White Fang Grunt, is able to take her out extremely easily all by himself. When normally Ruby would be able to wipe the floor with them, but without her scythe, she's a terrible hand-to-hand -hand fighter. She has zero yeah. strength and zero understanding of hand-to-hand. -hand. And it's nice to see that because it shows that these characters are still learning. They are still students, after all. And they are still teenagers, and they still have a lot to grow. Yeah, and that's, the, and and that's, the, second, that's the second thing. For all the praise that can talk about Ruby in how she acts, she still has something to learn. And mm. it makes sense because she is just in the second semester as someone to be a full on full on huntress yet and there there is a hello yeah yeah you broke up a little bit there it just completely uh, cut off it scared me again oh <laughs> yeah well i just that you know ruby does have have a lot of things we can credit her for but at the same time she still has some way to go we makes sense because it's just the second semester of her first year so yeah mm -hmm. um yeah. i I'll like the I, I like just the small part where like the grunt that captures her he's like i have some bad news and he's like why are you interrupting me and it's like and he shows her girl he's like that is bad news oh yeah with uh <laughs> torchwick and torchwick his, and... i guess his name's perry is technically his name i suppose yeah. he's like I, you know we have something to show you. Is it good news or bad news? Um, we found a girl, and he just pokes his head out, smoking the cigar. It's like that's very bad news, Perry. Yeah. <laughs> just again, Torchwick is a great villain in my opinion. Like they do, they work with him very well in terms of giving him great moments to see and all of that. And Ublik has some awesome moments as well, and this is why I love his love him as a teacher and really enjoy him. Like seeing his freak out about the underground city and like the revelation to him and how he just shares that revelation with everyone else is just really great to see yeah also it's like we didn't point this out last episode but it's something i definitely have to point out is you know how Uvlek like, is talking to the team and then all of a sudden the grim appear and he's grim and they're like what it's like grim right behind us right there <laughs> and he just says oh don't worry about it we'll track him don't fight him we'll track him it could be weeks or months or years even before he you know teams up with the rest before he meets the rest of his pack and it's like oh no there's the rest of the pack never mind yeah and is, the pack has seen us <laughs> he is so stream of conscious and i love it it's yes like, it's great yes is, that's the words i'm looking at. he's like, very much stream of conscious thought and it just comes out of his mouth it's just great <laughs> and I, I want to do a separate episode or maybe just mention this at the end just the voice actors he is so along with like i said crow even though i really enjoy crow i think he goes with the character design like ublek and whoever does him is like perfect for the character not even just the design but the yes. personality 
and mm -hmm. you know i Agreed. i have some issues with like who they chose because they did a lot of in-house voice acting which of course you know for the very first season was probably fine and they do get better like blake always fits her character and weiss fits her character ruby's fits her character but it just i just can't get past it because it's so squeaky and then it definitely changes a lot she definitely does. gets a lot better yeah well no, i know that but I, it's still kind of just oh yeah yeah it's still kind of haunting but it, understandable it, yeah it, it's just you know if i maybe had seen this show before i knew all of the cast behind them mm -hmm. i wouldn't have this many problems i said this last week with how yang is voiced by barbara dunkelman and i can't get past her like, you, her you only hear barbara dunkelman and then for Sun, I only hear, uh, what's his name? I forgot. Whoever yells a lot. Like, I always just hear him oh, yelling. Uh, and, yeah. It's not Miles. I don't know why you want to say Miles. That's so Miles is John. Is John, yeah. It's, um, <laughs> this is embarrassing. He... <laughs> uh, well, uh, let it's uh michael jones michael michael the other m yeah and i just hear him yelling all the time and it's like and then sometimes his voice like when he's just calling out is michael yelling it's like oh <laughs> i just can't get past michael yelling but and yeah that's fair like you know you've heard a lot of them in other videos and you know them very well like for me you know i'd never had that because i don't watch a lot of rooster teeth other stuff mm -hmm. so for me it was never something that bothers me and it's probably not something that hc has noticed or has bothered him either i'm sure right like i think voice actors i kind of did an imdb search uh, after the first season mm -hmm. uh none of, none of are recognizable to me okay yeah. And that probably can help with some enjoyment because instead of seeing basically Barbara Dunkelman as Yang, you see Yang for who she, for the character that she's trying to represent and everything. Mm -hmm. Even though it is yeah, very much... She actually, you know, in the later seasons, I really enjoy her work. Oh, yeah. yeah. Absolutely. Again, it's definitely something that you will see improvement on. Mm -hmm. And it gets kind of... And they get a little bit and a little bit further away from, okay, it's not this person doing this voice. It's this character. I can see that now. Uh-huh. <laughs> but um <clears throat> anything else to say about this episode? Uh, I don't think so. We I think we covered everything. All right. Moving on like Moving. a train with no brakes. Yep. Episode eleven, no brakes. Um, okay. Um uh, one quick thing if there's a train chase sequence in anything, there's a good chance I'm going to do it. And this is no exception. This was awesome. Yeah. And uh, okay, I have a for you because you are obviously ahead of me. Uh, at one point, there was like some sort, there was a girl with pink hair and like her face was a bit covered and she kind of gives it. Hmm? Oh, that's Neo. Neo. Oh. That was who we saw. Okay, earlier, that's yeah. Neo. Okay. So because I, the hair uh, color and everything, I thought it was Penny. For a second, I want, want to make sure it's <laughs> not her. No, that's not Penny. That is Neo. That is okay. everyone's favorite, favorite, <clears throat> everyone's favorite little psychopathic mute murderer. Okay, now I, I'm interested. I'm interested. I want to see. What Don't this be. Is you, you, I, I think that's more of a fan thing than it is an actual show thing because you never really see her being very psychopathic or murdery, other than this mm -hmm. one moment. <laughs> okay. Um. Sure. But she wipes the floor with Yang very handily. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And you get to see, you know, that she is very much a capable fighter and that Yang actually can't beat everyone she sees. Mm. And, you know, starting right off, right? Like, it's very much... There's some great moments here with Ublek still and him being Ublek, which is great. <laughs> it's yeah, and and uh, my favorite scene with Zwei, Zwei being a cannonball. That's great to see. Mm -hmm. Yeah, <laughs> that's one thing I train train chase uh, sequences, but uh, it also everyone had the moment to shine in this episode, and that's always <clears throat> appreciated when you have yeah. so many characters. Yeah, absolutely, and it it's nice to see, right? Like everyone gets their own separate little fight, right? Like you have Yang taking on Neo, and you get to see how. Yang still has a lot to learn, and how Neo is easily able to deal with Yang and just take her down 
no problem. You get to see a Weiss taking on a White Fang grunt, and you get to see <clears throat> one of the White Fang who aren't taken down in one hit and actually puts up a really good fight. Also a chainsaw mm -hmm. sword, essentially. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> yeah. But, you know, you get to see, like, Weiss puts up a good fight, but she's eventually beaten by this White Fang grunt and taken down. Like, that's very interesting to see because, again, it shows that even Weiss still has a lot to learn and isn't as good as, you know, you would think or she even she thinks she is. Blake's the only one who has any moment of, like, okay, she beat Torchwick, she won her fight, but she's immediately, you know, pulled away from being able to do anything or deal with Torchwick because she immediately has to take on this White Fang grunt because Weiss failed. Mm -hmm. And it kind of shows, right, like, Blake is the one who probably has the most outside of experience when it comes to fighting other people because of her past. Mm -hmm. And that's a nice little touch, I think. Hmm. Uh, you know, now that, now, now that you it is an awesome point. Yeah, I didn't, I didn't think about it. This. So, yeah. yeah, it's you know a nice I'm... little touch that the show does. I think we should okay, mention that cool. Yang is only saved by a mysterious figure coming in to stop Neo. Yeah, that I... mm -hmm. that's the same. Jump into the. That's the same figure from the post credit scene, right? It is. Okay. And if, if you're wondering, like, it's it's not hard to figure out from the show, but yet yeah, that is Yang's mom. Yeah. Well, you know, as soon as she takes off the mask and see that they, are, and that they look pretty similar to each other, I'm like, okay, that's, that's their mother. Yeah. A fun fact, right? I think, uh, well, that's Yang's mom. <clears throat> You know, hmm. worth mentioning there, Yang, Yang and Ruby have different moms. Same dad. Oh, okay. Mom. Okay. But uh, worth mentioning, right, that uh, you, uh, her name is Raven. Raven's model is actually hmm. Yang's model. It's the same exact model. Oh, okay. They uh, reused the models, if I'm not mistaken. It's the same exact model, and they redid it because, again, budget reasons and everything. And they did what they had to do, but if I'm not mistaken, they reused Yang's model for Raven. They just changed some stuff about the looks here and there. Okay, but that, that's that the same exact happens. model. I mean, yeah. you you can at least argue, hey, mother daughter, so they look alike. Oh yeah, sure, absolutely. Yeah. So you know, you know, I don't quote me on this, but I frozen the <clears throat> model for the mother and Elsa's mom is Elsa's coronation model the different dress and different hair color so oh. you know even even the big studios are doing that oh sure it saves time and it saves money right there's no yes. reason not to do it as long as you make it look halfway decent there's no reason not to do it and, I and honestly you, you can mask up a lot of modeling choices with clothing and accessories like you, you i didn't know that they were the same model until you told me because of how they dress differently is so much different like mm -hmm over the top oh yeah sure her gigantic fucking sword sheath <laughs> <laughs> very big i mean to be fair i think carries like how many other blades, different types of blades yeah hundred blades i don't know and which are all made out of which all have some you know dust connection to blades. dust and everything yeah hold on i need to google to it and pick up the same model nanki <laughs> <laughs> You could see that in How to Train Your Dragon 3. You know, Hiccup looks more like Star. Uh, you could see that. Old Hiccup, very big and burly. They used, you know what? They didn't. But they used the same build. Imagine Hiccup's voice coming out of Stoic. Oh, God. A model that looks no, like Stoic. Let's, let's just stop this right here and move. All right. Moving on, a lot of good little small fights that build up to. Our big finale and our big, great big fight scene, episode 12, The Breach. Okay, not the <clears throat> kind of DreamWalk sidestep for a second. Uh, something about the, the scenery and scale of the fight, um, I think uh, kind of, kind of uh, jumping into that show, did, was anyone else the ending <clears throat> to Troll Hunter season three? Uh huh. I wasn't reminded of it, but no. now that you brought it up, I could definitely, I could see it a little bit, I suppose. But no, I wasn't really. Well, reminded. actually, 
to me and rush. Do what? What? <laughs> you broke out again. Uh, uh, damn it. I, 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 that wolf, you, you probably watched Ruby before Troll Hunters, mm -hmm. so it may not have the same effect to you. This is this. It didn't have the it didn't have the same effect on me either. I was I didn't think about it at all. HC. I don't know something about the. Reminded me of it. I, I can know. see where you get it from. Mm -hmm. It again, it didn't remind me of it. Thinking about it, but I can see where you get the idea from. Like the idea of the scene is very similar. Like this big fight scene, and the city's you know very much under threat, right? Because Grim are yeah. in the city. <clears throat> Mm -hmm. But yeah, and just great, great fun. It's, it's also nice to see the other students coming in and helping out. But mm -hmm. again, like on top of my head, there's not much else to say as, outside, of, as, outside of great fight, great, great scene, everyone working together. And then like uh, one of them gets arrested. Roman. Roman, yeah. And then we have the entire... The Yang. That's. I, I personally don't have to say on the other. It it was a fun finale. Don't get me wrong. I just don't have much else to add it, to it. Like the big moment here is it's it's the fight scene. Like the fight scene is this is just the fight scene. Like that's the big moment here, right? Like just seeing mm -hmm. everything you've seen within the entire season come into play. You see, you know, we've seen a little bit of velvet here and there. And then we hear her mention her team. The big thing here is we see Team Coffee full and well now, right? Yeah. You know, we mm -hmm. see, we see Coco being very you know kick-ass and badass with basically a you know purse that changes up into a Gatling gun, you know, or a machine gun. It's crazy. It's mm -hmm. meant to be fun. This is you know we're here to sell you on the big fight scene. We get to see Fox. We get to see Yatsuhashi, and <clears throat> we get to see you know. All of that going on, we get to see Jean and his training paying off. You know, a little bit of a nod to that, how he's been training with Pira and how that, and how he's easily able to take down the air side with zero help now from Pira, right? And mm -hmm. we get to see Team Juniper and, you know, Ren and Norg, you know, they don't get to go off and do what they wanted to do in terms of going outside and helping a smaller city, a smaller settlement outside of, you know, Vale. They're all required to go there. We get to see our villains decide, hey, we can't sit back. We need to make it look like we're not involved with this and make it look like we do care about protecting the city, not destroying it. So let's kind of help out a little bit, quote unquote, right? We mm -hmm. get to see, you know, Emerald fight a little bit and how she and her fighting style and her weapons. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and we get to see, you know, even Port shows up, Glinda Goodwood shows up, right? Like it's all just let's take everything we've shown you, every little tidbit, and let's kind of throw it all into one big thing and have nods to everything, right? And it's also nice to see because we get, you know, it looks like our good guys have definitely been losing a lot throughout this volume, even if it's not been something they've been aware of. Taking the they've L. Definitely been... Yeah. Sure. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, it's it's nice to see them get a slight win, if you will, even though it's definitely our villains show it off as, eh, we didn't really lose much. It's still nice that our <laughs> our good guys feel like they've won a fight for even once it's all instead of loss. <laughs> Spoilers. Well, but, that's yeah. that's not my territory. <laughs> um, you know, do they? I want to say that all of these seem, and I know we can go back, like after we've done all of this, and talk about it. But it seems like all of these have a, all of the volumes have like a subtitle to them. Or should at least, right? Because what do you mean? Well, like they have a general theme to them. Um, oh, okay, yeah, sure. Like volume one is very much uh, welcome you know, school know. life. You know, welcome to Beacon welcome school Beacon. life. Yeah, you, know? you can either you yeah. can either sum it up as a, and I would even <clears throat> say like a, a a one word, um, like welcome, and then volume two is. Or volume one would even be like beginnings, and volume two is, uh, I don't know. I had a word for it, but because I, I like <laughs> after I watched it, because I thought we were doing this last week. If I'm being honest, I thought we were gonna do it every week, and so I had it ready for last week, that and was I didn't write the it plan. Down. Um, 
And blame then... HC, ladies and gentlemen. Well, mm. like I, I, yeah, blame HC. Actually, can blame. My... And then like, you broke we... up again, yeah, so broke up, so it's... we don't know who to blame. So we're just going to continue to blame you. Anyway, uh... and so I was saying, <laughs> I was just saying that it seems like. And then I have, like, the next few seasons. Unfortunately, I can't say, because that might spoil them. Um, although, since we are towards the end, I could probably say that Volume 3 can be best summed up as Fall. In several sure. several different ways. Sure. Yeah, I would agree. Like, it's very much, right, like, the volumes are set up as... They build upon one another, and they build mm -hmm. upon, and they escalate things within the world, the story, and, and you're you're always learning. And it's it's yeah, I would agree. It's very, definitely you could sum them up with like this is what they actually, are, and they I all just, have. Actually, like, I'm you know, interested. I'm interested in seeing since at the Wikipedia page, uh, it says that apparently the show passed away between season two and three. Yes, ah, so, yes. the show's uh, creator. Yeah, this is definitely something that we'll get into and talk a little bit more, especially with season three. Okay. Because his passing is, I think I mentioned this before, but his passing is definitely a little bit of a contention between fans in terms of mm -hmm. how people view volumes one, two. Now, there's definitely some viewpoints on especially volumes four and five that concern his passing, which is, okay. so in that's my opinion, something nonsensical. That we'll talk but... about later. Yeah, we'll definitely. It, it'll definitely be something that we probably will bring up and talk about. Yeah. Okay. Yep. Um, but yes, so... he did pass in between volumes two and three. Mm -hmm. So may you rest in peace, good sir. It, you created some good, and mm -hmm. I'm happy to finally watch it. Agreed. Mm -hmm. But yeah, with all that said, breach. It's a fun episode that basically is. This is all about the fight, the big final fight that saves the city. And that's all there is to it, really. Yep. And I guess we've mentioned it. We should talk. This This is the post. This is the episode that has the post credit sequence we've been mentioning where Yang encounters Raven again. <laughs> and Raven says, there's many things we need to talk about. I don't think the show has any major reference to this after the fact, if I'm not mistaken, in volume three. And there's, again, not much I can say about this without spoiling too many things, I don't think. But to me, this almost feels like a little bit like a dream sequence, really, because, again, like they just never mention it again. It's never brought up again, as far as I remember and aware. So it's a very <laughs> weird little post credit scene that I don't think goes much of anywhere. Well, to be honest, uh, the main reason is there is to probably to you know keep people interested and uh, oh, guessing yeah, sure. for season three. Absolutely, it's definitely there to make you. It's there if you didn't get earlier when Raven comes in to save Yang. If you didn't figure out that she was her mother, then this is basically yeah, she's her mother. This is her mom. Say hello to Yang's mom. Hi, Yang's mom. This is that scene to really just hammer it in home. If you didn't get it before. And to keep people interested in guessing as to what might come up with volume three. Mm -hmm. Okay. But I guess moving in, ending thoughts of the volume. Um, pretty much like I said, I and I'm looking forward to seeing where it goes next. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Rush. I thought it was great. Um, after seeing as I have already seen the rest of it, I think it's great build up. Uh, and good setup mm -hmm. as well. I would agree. I think Volume 2 takes what Volume 1 did well, does it better, adds a lot of good stuff to it overall, and is great setup for Volume 3. And mm -hmm. I can't wait to hear HC's thoughts pertaining to Volume 3 and what he thinks. We'll oh, boy. It. Let's see. Uh, I'll try and... Right. <laughs> just cuts out again. I mm -hmm. it cut out. Uh, it yeah. did. We, do. we need to. I'll try and watch season three in the weekend. That's what okay. I said. We need to make the, like right. we'll we to... need to make these shorter because like the longer we go on, the more you cut out. We mm -hmm. it does. So well, Hard... we kind of finished. So Wolf, mm -hmm. the wrap up is yours. 
All right. Well, with all of that said, I have been Wolf, and this I have been your host, Wolf, and this has been Ruby Volume 2 and our coverage of it and our general opinions and thoughts. We hope you enjoyed. If you want to get in touch with us, you can find us at, if, bleh, I should say, if you have any thoughts about what we've said here or about the volume itself or about Ruby itself, share them in the comments below this video. If you want to get in touch with us, you can do so at the Birdcast Tumblr, which is Birdcast Team. Go there, follow us, ask us questions, hang out with us, I suppose. Also, if you want to just get updates on when we upload videos, you can follow us on Twitter at Birdcast, capital B, capital C. And as I said, with all that said, I've been your host, Wolf, and I've been joined by... HC, who was very enjoy, who was really enjoy seeing. But I just have to say. <laughs> and okay then. Mm -hmm. Goodbye. Bye. See ya. <laughs>